Good morning, everyone. Good morning, and welcome to Partick South Church. Whether you're here in the church or watching at home, you are most welcome. Just for those who are watching at home this morning, there has been a oh, that there's been a problem with the internet connection, so you won't be able to see it this morning, but you'll catch it on catch up. Is that what they say in the BBC? If you can't watch, you'll catch it on catch up. All are welcome. Just a few intimations for you. Oh, come on, you. Here we are. I've got a few intimations for you today. After the service, there's tea and coffee through in our church hall, to which everyone is welcome to come and join us. Our Lent Bible study continues on Tuesday at 11 o'clock to noon. It is called Be Still. Thank you to everyone who's brought eggs so far for the Lodging House Mission. This was going to be the last Sunday, but I've got a very sort of busy week ahead, so I won't be taking them until a week in Monday or a week in Tuesday. So if you're forgotten and you want to bring more next week, then please feel free to do so. I'll be a week in Sunday at the earliest before I'll be able to take them to the Lodging House Mission. On Tuesday, the 29th of March at 7.30, there'll be a trustees meeting to discuss and approve the 2021 accounts, as well as a presbytery plan update. Just to remind you that Eddie Irvin's funeral will be here in the church this Thursday at 2 p.m. and then Clyde Bank Crematorium at 3.30. As from next Sunday, we're no longer required to take attendance at church, so May, Mark, Fiona, Big Gordon, and all those who have helped at the table outside to get people's details as they enter. Can I say thank you for your help and support over the last two years? It's been quite a lot of commitment for everybody to be there and to do that, that job. So as from next week, because May won't be at the, the table, welcome everyone. She's going to open up the Bill Bingham room from half past 10 to 5 to 11 for anyone who wishes to get in for a time of quiet prayer. I know sometimes when we come into church, we just sometimes just like to sit and, and just be quiet. And I also know sometimes churches at that point can also be a bit noisy with people rushing about and doing things. So if you want, the Bill Bingham room will be open from 10.30 to 10.55 for anyone who just wants to get in and sit and have a time of peace and quiet before the service begins. And to remind you that next Sunday, the clocks go forward one hour, which means we lose an hour in our bed. And finally, <coughs> Govan and Linthouse Parish Church are looking for old, worn shoes. So these are just shoes you've got lying about that are no longer any good. They're putting together a shoe statue called Walking in the Footsteps of Jesus. And if you have any old shoes, can you please bring them over the next couple of weeks and I will deliver them over to Govan and Linthouse Parish Church prior to Holy Week. It's to let you know now as well that anybody who donates his shoes, the shoes are going to be outside, so we won't be able to donate them to a charity afterwards. So basically they'll go and be recycled through one of the recycle bins, but they won't be given to like Shelter or the Salvation Army because they're going to be outside for maybe a week or two. So that's any old shoes you've got. Even if it's an odd shoe, you've got the right, but you've lost the left, then just please bring that as well, and I'll have a box set up outside for those who can do it. We've gathered to worship God. Let's see our call to worship as shown on the screen. Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his love endures forever. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, on this third Sunday in Lent, we gather to praise you, our Heavenly Father, to give you our thanks for your good and your love endures forever. We come to remember and to celebrate the good news of Jesus Christ. He was the one who chose the harder path and invites us to follow in his footsteps. We come thankful for your Holy Spirit's presence to worship, pray, and to receive your blessing through your Holy Spirit. We come as we are, your beloved children, to worship you, our Heavenly Father. Friends gathered here today and those who are at home, let us come close to God as God comes close to us, for we gather in Jesus' name. Amen. I can invite you to stand if you're able as we stand and sing, all creatures of our God and King.
Well, good morning, guys. How are we today? Are we good? Well, I've brought some things to show you today, and it's a whole mixture of things, but it's all the same thing. It's all fruit. Who likes fruit? Anybody like fruit? What's your favourite fruit? Pineapple. Oh, I, I'm not a great pineapple fan, but my wife May loves pineapple. And about oh, a long time ago, we were in a place called Hawaii, and we went to a place called the Doll Pineapple Factory. And at the Doll Pineapple Factory, they made fresh pineapple ice cream. I was going to say it was delicious, but I'm not sure because I got a lolly for me and I got a, a, a lolly for me, so we would work cohen with the ice cream on top. And me, she ate it hers very quickly. And I had to nip to the bathroom, so I said to me, can you hold that a wee second while I go to the bathroom? See when I come back? It was gone as well. It was gone as well. It's the best pineapple ice cream that we've ever, ever had. What about the boys? you have a favourite fruit? Can you think of anything? An apple, or an orange, or a plum, or anything? Oh, an orange, you like an orange. I know, I'm not so keen on oranges, but I like satsumas. And I've brought here just some, some different fruits. I've got apples, I've got tangerines, and I've got bananas. And I've also brought this thing here. Do you know what this is? Do you have an idea what that could be? It's a smoothie. Yeah. And every morning I have a fruit smoothie. This is my one from this morning. I'm going to have it for lunch. And there's raspberries, strawberries, blackberries, blueberries, black currants, red currants, all in this. And it's all mixed up, mixed up into a big mush. It's really like a mush. And then I drink that every morning for my breakfast. And then after that, I have a big plate of porridge. I love having my fruit. You've got a favourite fruit. I've got a favourite fruit. And we all like different fruits. We all like different types of fruits, different kinds of fruits. But before I tell you about my favourite fruit, I want to tell you a wee story about my next door neighbour. I live up in Knightswood, as many of you know. And many, many years ago, my next door neighbour neighbor bought an apple tree. An apple tree just like this. This is the beginning of an apple tree. And they put it in their back door. And I couldn't see it for a while. And then suddenly I saw it starting to pop above the fence. And I was wondering, oh, I wonder what that is. And then they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then suddenly there was apples starting to appear on it. And I thought, oh, well, that's great. But really, it's my neighbor's apple tree. There's not much I can do about that. Because if I go and take the apples off it, then what's that? That's stealing. So I thought, oh, Lord, I just love to look at those apples. Would you just bless me? And then one day when I was watching out the back window, I saw a squirrel. And a squirrel was running along the fence. And my next door neighbor had taken a couple of apples from the apple tree and put it on her fence that joins the two houses together. And I looked at the squirrel eating the apples and I was like, oh, Lord, I would love, I would love an apple, but I can't go out and take the squirrel's apples. That's not really fair on the squirrels. And then something amazing happened. The doorbell went. No, no, I wonder who that is. And I went through, and it was my next door neighbour. And you know what she had? An apple crumble. A lovely, delicious, next one, yeah. A lovely, delicious, tasty apple crumble. And every year since then, when the apple starts to disappear off a tree, I listen for the doorbell. <laughs> because I know at some point there's going to be an apple crumble will come. And it's lovely fresh apples with the crumble. And is anybody getting hungry? Because I'm getting hungry. And she makes this lovely apple crumble. And I watch this tree every year. And I've started watching it this year because I'm watching for the wee flowers and then for the apples to come because I know that I'm going to get a lovely apple crumble. So of all the fruits that I have for my breakfast and all the fruits I eat during the day, my favorite fruit is this, apple crumble. So if you ever want to think, I'll buy the minister some nice fruit for his breakfast, well, an apple crumble is a one, one for me. There's all these different fruits, all these different ways that we can look at fruit. And Jesus tells us a story in the Bible about fruit. And he tells us a story. It's a story of a time when it wasn't an apple tree, but it was a fig tree. And the fig tree was planted in the garden, and it had been in the garden for many years. They called it a vineyard or an orchard. It was there with all the other fruit trees. 
all the fig trees were all there together. But there was this one tree, and it never gave any figs one year. And the person who owned it watched the fig tree. And the second year, it never gave any figs. And then the third year, it never gave any figs. It had been given figs for a long, long time, but it stopped giving figs. And the man who owned the tree came and said this, for three years I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. It's just taken space up in the garden. The one who owned the vineyard wanted the tree taken down and replanted with another fruit tree. But the gardener who was in, who looked after all the trees, said, please, sir, give it one more chance. Leave it for another year. I will give it special attention. I'll dig around it and give it plenty of fertilizer. If the tree produces fruit next year, great. Then you don't cut it down. And that story is an important story for us also. Next one. No, that's us. It's a very important story for us because if we don't produce fruit, then maybe God will come and cut us down. And that's not a very nice thing to think about. So what we have to think about is we have to look at our lives and we have to ask ourselves, are we producing fruit? Are we helping the world? And some of the fruit that God talks about in the Bible are things like love and joy and peace and faithfulness and gentleness and caring. And there's a pineapple, kindness and goodness and peace and patience. And as long as we are producing all these fruits and we're helping our world to be better, then God is going to look at us and say, well done. Well done for looking after people. And the other thing that we can do that helps us produce fruit is that we can come to church regularly and be part of the family because we're just like one big tree of apples. We all have a different role to play, but we're all the same. We're all followers of Christ. And we come together as a world, as in worship, we come to pray, and we come to sing. One last thing. Do you like my apple tree? Well, I'm going to go and plant that this week in the church garden somewhere. And I want to plant it somewhere where we're able to see it. And then we can watch it each year. And every year that it produces apples, we'll be able to go to it. And just remember this about God. And to remember how Jesus came and says, I'll help look after you. I'll tell the land. I'll take care of you. And Jesus will be there to help us. So even when we make mistakes, Jesus says, give you one more chance, one more opportunity to produce fruit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we know that you expect good things from your children. Help us to live a life that will be pleasing to you. Help us to bear fruit in the place that we live in called Partick, or wherever we may be from in Glasgow or beyond. Help us to produce fruit that tells others about the love of Jesus. And help us to produce fruit so that your kingdom vineyard will become ever bigger. Help us, Father, now as we say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. I can invite you to stand if you're able as we stand together and sing. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so.
Heavenly Father, as the young ones go, learn more about the love of Jesus. May they go with these words ringing in their ears, that Jesus loves them, Jesus cares for them, and Jesus will always be with them. Be with them, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and bless them now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Off you go. Remember and keep me a satchima. Just before we, we have our next prayer, I need to let you know a little bit of information about the presbytery plan that's going on in the background at the moment. So as some of you have known that the Church of Scotland are cutting their numbers quite drastically by 40% ministers and ministries. So we've been allocated a zone and it's zone one. And in zone one, there's 29 churches, mainly from the West End. So from St. George's Church Tron in the city centre, a way out to... Um, but it's Drum Chapel, and as far up as Mary Hill and beyond. So it's quite a, a large area. So there's 29 churches, and we've been allocated 17 positions. So as I've said before, that some churches will have to get into a union, some will have to link, and some will be okay. But also some churches will be closing in time to come, certainly within the next five years. So we've been asked to make a decision about how we want to work with those 29 churches or do we want to use a smaller group called a cluster? So on the 29th of March, I think it is, that the, the trustees are meeting and it's one of the things that the trustees are going to be talking about is whom do we want to partner up with and what does that look like? But what I would like everybody to do is, <coughs> excuse me, if you can pray for the trustees because we really need the wisdom of the trustees in how we move forward as a church whether we stay as our are and whatever implications they are, or whether we link or unite with other churches. I mentioned earlier on that I can't take the Easter eggs this week to the Lodging House Mission because my week's very busy. There is lots of stuff on, but there's also a, quite a few churches out there who have asked to speak to me about the possibility of partnering up with, with Partick South Church. So these conversations will be happening throughout the week ahead, and then I can inform the trustees next Tuesday the sort of ideas that people have so that the trustees can then make the decision on how they wish to go forward. So please, if you can pray for me during the week as I have these conversations behind the scenes, but also for the trustees, because on a week and Tuesday, they have to make some very difficult decisions about how we move forward together as a church. If you do have any questions about it, please, can you speak to me? Give me a call, ask me at the door, whatever it may be, and I'll let you know whatever information that I have that I can give you, I will certainly most uh, happily give you that information. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we gather to worship you, to glorify you, to honour you, and to praise you in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit. But Lord, I'm also conscious that in the background there's all this stuff going on with presbytery plans. I'm conscious, Lord, that in the zone that we're in of 29 churches, none of us know our future in terms of our buildings, whom we partner with, or how we move forward. But all of us know one thing. Jesus is in charge. And as long as we follow Jesus, listen to your Holy Spirit, and discern your call for Partick South, then we know as we move forward, in whatever form that may be, that Jesus' hand is in it. And if Jesus' hand is in it, then all will be well. Because it's him we trust, not the Church of Scotland. Not the ministers or the hierarchy, but Jesus. So help us, Lord, as a church over the week and months ahead to discern what the Spirit is saying about Partick South and where you're calling us to serve and to lead and to worship. Be with us, Father, Son, and Spirit and guide our footsteps 
in these difficult days ahead. For we need the Spirit's blessing to be with us as we continue to journey with Jesus. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite Fiona to come and share our Bible reading for today. We read this morning from the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 13, starting at verse 1 and reading through to verse 13. Luke at verse 1. Now, there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than other Galileans because they suffered in this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard. And he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig round it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. And if not, then cut it down. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues. And a woman was there who'd been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Amen, and may God bless these words to our hearts. Thank you, Fiona. We stand together, if you're able, as we stand and sing. We sing a love that sets all people free.
There's a couple of old sayings that you will be familiar with. The first one is, why does God allow good things to happen to bad people? Or similarly, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? To be honest with you, I can't give you a definitive answer. However, however, today I hope in some way to maybe help us answer that conundrum. I plan to do that by looking at the first nine verses of a reading in three sections. The first two sections describe two different tragedies, and then there's a parable that ties it all up. So tragedy one, verses one to three. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with the sacrifices. Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will perish. We don't know anything about this incident involving Pilate and the Galileans. But what we do know was there were a group of Galileans who were either maimed or killed by Pilate, and their blood was mixed with the temporal sacrifices. It was a common thought in the first century that untimely or tragic deaths were usually the result of someone's sinful life. If we were to think of that story possibly in a more modern way, if we were to substitute the word Putin for Pilate in the story, and the devastation and bloodshed that he is responsible for in Ukraine. Are those who have been killed in Ukraine's sins any worse than you or I sins? Jesus says, no. Those Galileans or those Ukrainians' sins are not any worse than anyone else's. Then you should repent or you too will perish. In other words, repent and be saved. And then there's the second tragedy in verses 4 and 5. Of those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. In this tragedy, we hear of 18 people who seem to be minding their own business, passing by or through the Tower of Siloam, and it fell upon them. People going about their normal everyday living when suddenly they were caught up in this terrible accident. When the tower collapsed without notice, they were gone. A modern day incident involving not a tower, but two towers. Many of us will remember how we watched in horror in 2001, following a terrorist attack on the Twin Towers in New York. Two buildings full of people who were going about their daily business, when suddenly their lives were taken. Many of us watched in shock and distress and dismay as the buildings crumbled. And like the previous story, was it the sins of the people in the Twin Towers that caused this tragic death? 
Of course not. They are not any more guilty in the eyes of God than you or I or anyone else. So again, Jesus gives a similar answer to the last question, which was, repent or perish. So what should those gathered before Jesus do? Well, the moral of the two stories is this. You don't know the minute, the time, or the day. When evil will strike, or a tragic accident will happen. So repent and be saved. I remember prior to preaching a soul nominee for the minister here back in August 2010. It was two or three weeks or so before it. In fact, it was between August and my starting day. I preached soul nominee You'd give me permission to be your new minister. And it was between that time and October. May was working for a film, film, a, a company in Hillington. So we knew when we were going to be moving into the manse. And during that period between August and September, I had phoned my stepfather one night and my mum. I chatted to them on the phone. I hanged up the phone, went to bed. At lunchtime the next day, my mum phoned me and said, you need to come to the hospital immediately and bring me. What's up, mum? It's your stepdad. Something's happened and I've told him he's dying. I spoke to him the night before on the phone and we had a laugh. We had a carry on on the phone as we always did. And then suddenly out of the blue, we get this call. May was preparing for her final lunch, being taken out by her bosses in her workplace. It was her last day at work. And suddenly, everything stopped as we went to the hospital. Fortunately or unfortunately, we arrived, but moments before Jim, my stepfather, passed away. And I'm sure you've all got stories. Stories of a loved one, their untimely death, One moment they're here, the next they're gone. I remember Billy Niven, our our treasurer, and how on the Wednesday Billy came to Wednesday worship. Chatted with Billy, had a great time with Billy, laughing with Billy as we always did, only for the Thursday to get a call, saying that Billy had suddenly passed away, without warning, without any notice. And I'm sure you have all got Stories, the shock, the dismay. And what I believe Jesus is trying to tell us here is that we don't know the minute, the day, or the time. So we need to get right with God. We need to make ourselves right with God. We need to be right with God. And we need to encourage those whom we love and we care for to make sure they're right with God. I use the story of my stepfather, Jim Carrollton, because I do not know his faith. I do not know if he had a faith. I know he was brought up as Catholic, but he never went to the chapel. So I do not know if he's repented of his sins prior to his death or whether he perished. We all know, or most of us know, Billy Niven, and I think we can be pretty sure where Billy is today. And that's a good thing. But I don't know about my stepfather. And many of you know I've also lost two brothers. I don't know about my two brothers. Where they are today. My prayer is they're safe in the arms of Jesus. Of course, reality can be sometimes something different. The third section is a parable that Jesus tells to pull all this together. Verse 6 to 9. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in the vineyard. And he went out to look for fruit on it and did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? 
Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year. I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. Jesus sums up these two tragedies with a parable that is helpful to help us understand why God allows good things to happen to bad people and bad things to happen to good people. In the Bible, Israel was God's chosen people. Even today, Israel is God's chosen people. And the image of the fig tree was associated with Israel. In the parable, the man who owned the fig tree represents God. The gardener represents Jesus. The fig tree represents Israel. And God had been looking for his people to return to him via his son Jesus. However, they were not willing. Notice in verse 7 it says, For three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Is this an allusion to Jesus' three years in ministry? He began his ministry at the age of about 30 and he was crucified about the age 33. Is this God saying, for three years I've sent my son to give you all the evidence, to show you who I am, to reveal Father God to you? But you're not coming. You're not producing fruit. You're not coming back to me. So what should God do? Pass judgment upon them? Verse 7, cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? I hope today that God's not saying that about any of us. Because that's a realistic thing with this passage. Is that God could be saying right now, they're not producing fruit. They're not helping the world. They're not this or not that. God makes that judgment, not me. Cut it down. Why should they waste soil on them? But then Jesus comes into the equation. And this is where we are so blessed Verses 8 and 9. Sir, the man replied, which I believe to be Jesus, leave it alone for one more year. I'll dig around it, fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, cut it down. Jesus says, I'll tend it, look after it, fertilize it. Just give it one more chance. Show mercy, not judgment. And unfortunately, although Jesus shows outstanding mercy, giving Israel one more chance, one more opportunity, even going to the cross for them, Israel doesn't repent and judgment comes. In AD 70, Jerusalem was ransacked by the Romans and the temple was destroyed. The fig tree, Israel, that was offered mercy refused to repent and judgment fell. So how does all this help us answer those questions I asked at the beginning? Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? Well, one thing is for sure, it's got absolutely nothing to do with their or our sins. But most importantly, it's a wrong question to ask. For apart from Jesus, who is good? Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. From Adam and Eve, to Andy and May McIntyre, to everyone in between, and to all those to come, not one could be classed good enough to call themselves righteousness. Romans 3 verse 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So if no one is good, then that means we are all flawed. We have all sinned. We have all fallen short of God's standard. The problem is that all of us, at least partially, have been disobedient in one way or another. And I know that's uncomfortable to hear because it's uncomfortable to say. But if we want to be truly saved, then we must not only accept it, but also to deal with it. Why does good things happen to bad people? So that we can be reconciled back to God through Jesus Christ, through the cross of Calvary. 
because God has mercy beyond anything we will ever know. And God is patient. And God wants to reconcile everyone back to him through his son. Not only does God want to reconcile all of Israel back to him, but also us. You see, not only does Israel represent the fig tree, but so do we. So do we. And Jesus has come to till our soil with his mercy, water us with his spirit, and fertilize us with his holy word. Friends, I spoke about my stepfather and my two brothers. I spoke about Bill and Niven. They have already stood before God and received the judgment that is just and right, whatever that may be. And one day, each of us will stand before God and face judgment. It is only a matter of time. It is only a matter of time until the vineyard is cleared of unfruitful trees. But before then, Jesus has given you and I one more chance, one more opportunity to produce fruit, one more opportunity to repent and not perish. You see, we know from history that the parable of the fig tree was acted out for real at a later stage in Jesus' ministry. When he cursed a fig tree on his journey from Bethany towards Jerusalem on his last fateful week, Jesus said time had come, this tree is not shown any fruit, and put a curse on it. For that one it was too late. But today we've been warned that it's not too late. And that's the good news that we receive today. And all this terrible death and terrible words that we don't like to hear. The good news we receive today is that it doesn't matter how bad you've blown it. It doesn't matter how much you fail God, blasphemed, sinned or disobeyed. Today God has given you one more chance, one more opportunity, one more time to clean the slate. So can I encourage you today to grab it with both hands, to repent and do not perish, to repent and be saved, so that when the day of judgment comes, mercy will trump judgment on that day. Let us pray. In the Bible, the Apostle Paul says at one point that he is the worst of sinners, the greatest of sinners. Well, I think I could give Paul a run from his money when I look at my past, my flaws, my disobedience, my regrets, my sins. But what about when you look at your past? Is there something in the chink of armor? Something unconfessed? Something embarrassing? Something that only you know? That you also know grieves your heart? but also grieves the heart of God. Jesus says, give it one more chance. One more chance to produce the fruit of repentance. One more chance. And this morning Jesus offers out to you his mercy. His mercy that he won through the cross of Calvary when he declared, Father, forgive them. None of us knows what's going to happen when we leave this building today. But we know one thing. One day we will stand before God. And one day we will be judged 
Jesus says, all who come to him will be saved. So whatever the Holy Spirit is stirring up within you, whatever the Holy Spirit is bringing to the forefront of your mind, then let us repent now. Let us say sorry to Jesus right this moment. Let us ask for his mercy and his forgiveness to flow into our lives. And let us be saved. Let us know our eternal destination before we leave this building today. Each one of us have to make that decision for ourselves. I cannot make it for me. My wife may cannot make it for me. So you have to make it yourself. Repent or perish. Repent and be saved. Why don't you choose this moment? (coughs) We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand if you're able as we stand and sing as a deer pants for the water so my soul longs after you. Let us come before the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have blessed us with so much. And in return for the blessings we bring before you, our offerings, our offerings of time, talent, and wealth, accept them and receive them as tokens of our love. May they be used wisely and lead to all kinds of kingdom possibilities and kingdom fruit. God of all, we weep for the pain of our broken world and a dry and weary land where there is no water 
and where our choices are often led to pain, we cry to you for healing. Hungry for hope, we look to you for the bread of heaven and the water of life. God of all, we mourn the senseless loss of life as a boat carrying refugees capsizes off the coast of Libya. We long for governments to create a fair and humane settlement program. While we watch and pray, we remember the dead and seek justice and we recommit, recommit to opening our hearts and our homes, saving who we can and when we can, reaching out to others with generosity that we have received from you. God of all, we lament the failure of peacemaking and peacekeeping as war rages across Ukraine and fresh fighting breaks out in the Defor region of Sudan and hunger spreads across the land and people starve in war zones as armed groups attack civilians in Ethiopia as acts of brutality are committed against the innocent here and elsewhere. We long for the protection of the vulnerable. We pray for the safety of journalists telling the truth in war zones, for the freedom of voices that challenge the status quo, for the laying down of arms and for the end of armed conflict. Hungry for hope, we look to you for the bread of heaven and the water of life. God of all, we long for peace of mind and heart. As children of war struggle with trauma, we know too that many are struggling in our neighbourhoods and our families. Many people who are fearful for the future, lonely, bereaved, are ill in mind or body. In the silence of this sanctuary and in our homes, we name before you the people we know who need your healing. And we also bring the people of Ukraine before you as the devastation unfolds in our midst. Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, may the needs of each person be fed with kindness and with love. And today, Father, we hold on to your promise that you will come close to us when we call on you. So we lift up our voices and speak your name in all the troubles of this world and in the waywardness of our own hearts. In the shadow of your wings, may we find rest. May we find fresh vision for the future and the strength to travel on with Jesus. We call on you, our God. Feed us and strengthen us. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to finish by standing to sing, Lord of the Church, we pray for our renewing.
Christ over all, our undivided day. Fire of the Spirit, burn for our enduring. Wind of the Spirit, find the living flame. We turn to Christ amid us. As we go from this place, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. (coughs) Let us say the grace together as shown on the screen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Please be seated.